Little experiment here today, my friends and family. We are um, using the Nikon ZF as a, as a filmmaking tool, not a still tool. Had an absolute blast yesterday. Went up to Valles Caldera and did a snowshoe hike. Not that far, about three and a half miles, but in deep snow and snowshoes and three and a half miles, it feels like about 10 miles. We, it, there were three of us. We did see other people at a distance on the horizon, and but on the hike that we were on, there was not a single other person around. And if you don't know what Valles Caldera is, it's worth looking up. Uh, it's a super volcano of sorts. Hopefully it won't blow in my lifetime, but uh, there is potential there. I am kind of changing up what I'm doing here on the channel a little bit because a lot of the things that I do on a daily basis that I just do for me for fun or for part of my process, I kind of feel like are either misunderstood or there's an interest in them for whatever reason that I'm kind of shocked by, journaling being one of them. I was cutting this letter up. This is from Chris, the guy who sent me, Chris, number one, thank you sent me a karst stone paper journal, which feels like it has coated stock on the outside and the inside. It's a beautiful, beautiful journal. And he sent me two fountain pens, a Mont Blanc Meisterstruck, something like that, and then a forest something. It's like a Japanese fountain pen, forest ranger something. They're awesome. The, the, the forest one has like a medium tip and the Mont Blanc has like a very fine tip. I love them both. He also sent me a handwritten letter, and Chris, I like your handwriting. And I am cutting this out because your letter is going to end up in my journal. And now, I think a lot of you, maybe not a lot of you, but some of you out there right now are saying, good grief, what are you, in elementary school? You're using scissors and you're gonna glue someone's letter into your journal? How immature, how ridiculous, how stupid could you possibly be? And the reason I'm saying that is because I have heard that from fellow photographers in the past. People who take themselves very, very seriously all the time, who would never stoop to doing something like this, pasting it, using scissors and glue in, in their adult life would be beneath them. My advice to you is to get rid of those people as fast as possible. Get them out of your life. If you have people in your life that are laden, fully laden, which is a word that I absolutely love, laden by ego and insecurity. Get them out of your life, they're holding you back. Glue, by the way, is not just fun to eat or sniff. It's fun to tack things into a journal. So I will show you eventually, maybe, how that ended up in my journal, but I've got a lot more filmmaking stuff coming up about journaling because I think it's one of the things that I actually have some value that I can add and help you with a journal because I think it's one of the most important things you can do. However, we have to have a discussion. We have to have this talk, and this is gonna trigger some of you who are a little bit more on the sensitive side, but frankly, as you know by now, I don't care. And I think when I say and do things that trigger people, it teaches me a lot about the current climate that we're living in that people can be so easily triggered by things that are just mind-blowingly simple to me. This will be for the thumbnail. Okay, got my thumbnail out of the way. Trix, Trix, 20 rolls. I'm giving this away to a young photographer here in Santa Fe who is taking their first photography class, Photo 101, starts in the dark room. Same class I took back in 1988 and uh, screwed up my first roll big time uh, in the dark room, but that was what led me to becoming a photographer. And the thing we need to talk about is this concept of saying no and the concept, the bullshit concept in my opinion, that is the fake it till you make it mentality that permeates the creative industry. I have a question for you. If you had to have a heart valve transplant and your doctor came in, let's say the hospital just happened to have a heart surgeon on staff and the heart surgeon came in and said, look, I'm the person that's gonna do your your heart valve replacement, and um, but listen, I didn't go to medical school. Like, I watched some videos on YouTube and I'm pretty sure I know how to do this. I think we're gonna be fine. Are you ready? Just sign the paperwork, let's go. Would you do that? Also, let's say that you were, you were, you thought you were driving a van load of elderly people to the bingo parlor, but in actuality, what you were doing was accidentally human trafficking. And you're looking at 15 to 30 in a maximum security penitentiary. And your court-appointed lawyer comes in and says, look, I didn't go to law school. 
um, I watched some videos on, on YouTube and I think I got a pretty good grasp of what's going. Are you ready to move forward with this trial? Uh, or let's say that your pilot came on the intercom and said, you know, I didn't go to flight school. I just watched some YouTube videos, and, um, but I'm pretty sure I know how to land. Uh, you guys ready to take off? Are you going to get on that flight? What if your plumber comes over and says, I didn't have any apprenticeship or any training, uh, but I watched some YouTube videos and I'd like you to pay $10,000 for me to fix the tree roots in your sewer line. Are you going to do any of these things? No. The obvious answer is no. You're not going to board the flight. You're not going to use the lawyer. You're not going to use that person as a heart surgeon. But for some reason in the creative space, this bullshit concept of fake it till you make it is widely accepted. And I think if I had to look for the biggest violator in the creative world, it is photography by far. In photography, the reason the quality bar of what we're seeing from the quote professional market is so low is first of all, the, 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 the barrier to entry is zero anymore, which I actually think there's an upside to, but there's no barrier to entry. But this widely accepted practice of fake it till you make it without any training whatsoever. And when I talk to photographers about training, the number one response I get is just people being offended. How dare you say to me that I need training? Here's the, here's the tough truth, which is gonna trigger a lot of you folks. The vast majority who are out there, and I, by the way, I get inundated with emails from folks who are watching this channel, which is a good thing, and I've encouraged you to email me. I get inundated by people asking for me to look at their work and help them improve. And the truth is, like, I got six emails yesterday alone for, for people asking for that. And the truth is, I don't have time to do that. I don't have time to review work like that, which is one reason I have this channel. It's one reason I teach workshops twice a year. Spain in May, uh, Japan in September, those are the times where I get to work with people over a week-long period face-to-face -face, where I feel like I can really do something to help them get better. But the truth is, the underlying truth is that the vast majority of you have not worked nearly hard enough to get good at photography. Like one person yesterday wrote me a question about composition in particular. You get better at composition by practice, by daily practice over a multi-year period to understand how you see the world. There is nothing I can do outside of basic parameters and basic suggestions to get you where you need to be. It is on you to shoot every single day. And a lot of you can't do that. You have families, you have jobs, whatever. But here's the other thing that escapes a lot of folks. What is that noise? Something metal on metal. By the way, behind the camera is my wife's nest in the living room. I cleared it out yesterday. It is like if you came in your house and you found that there was a squirrel nesting in your living room. It is the, it's like a seven-year-old's pockets. It's filled with like fake spiders and yo-yos and marbles and crayons. And there's a nest and I cleared it yesterday and I looked around this morning and it's back. So I think something's making a weird noise. You've got to work harder. I can only give you basic suggestions about composition. It's about you going into the world and taking those basic suggestions and then refining it into your vision. And that is a difficult thing to do. I've mentioned this many times before. It took me 10 years of shooting professional on assignment for 10 years before I was like, oh, now I get it. 10 years every day. Now I might be slow compared to a lot of people, but this idea that you're gonna watch a couple of YouTube films and go out and be a professional photographer and be good I'm not saying you can't do that and actually get work because you will get work. We know I've said this a million times before and I said it just a couple of minutes ago. The barrier to entry is almost nil. It's, there's almost nothing stopping anybody with a camera from getting work, but that doesn't mean you're good. And I just wanna give you a personal example here, a couple of different examples. So on a weekly basis now, and this is just not now, but the filmmaking part is now, I get requests to do commercial work all the time. And that's still photography. And now I'm starting to get it from people asking me to make videos or films for them. And by the way, the people who have the semantics about a film or a video, I don't care, motion piece, call it whatever you want. I get requests to do commercial still photography. I don't wanna do commercial photography. So I pass those jobs on to other photographers. And that's one of my favorite things to do when a client comes to me and says, we want you to do this. And I say, look, I don't have the time to do this or this is not right for me. However, here's a photographer that can do it. I love sending work to legitimate people who are deserving of that work because I know the client is gonna think back to me and say, Jesus, that guy did us a solid by giving us this photographer who can really perform. The other thing I'm doing is I got, uh, 
so I got requests to do uh, promote companies over the last month or so. Let's just take the last month, even the past couple of weeks. I have been approached by photo related companies that wanted me to promote and do and actually do sort of collaborations with them. I said no to all of them. And I was also approached by a company that wanted me to sell like, well, how would I put this? Um, well, I've had panel boards again in the past couple of weeks. I said no to them because I know they don't really want to do a partnership. They just want bullshit stuff. And also a company that wanted me to work with them to, to on their marketing for, I guess you would call it a lawn maintenance product. Now, why on earth you would come to me for a lawn maintenance product? And here's the thing, people. I never get to the budgeting stage. I never get to the negotiating stage because I'm not the right person to do that. Why would you come to me for lawn maintenance stuff? I don't have a lawn and I don't even have leaves where I'm at. No, the correct answer in these environments is no. You do not do those jobs. That is not, that's not gonna help you in the long run. So when somebody comes to me with a bad, a bad partnership or marketing thing, no. I get asked to work on other marketing teams, I say no. I get asked for the photo industry related products and things, I say no. Lawn maintenance, no. Paddle boards, no. But here's the most important thing. A couple of weeks ago, I get an email from a national birding organization and they saw something I did last year and said, hey, we saw this thing that you did, we like it. Can you do this for us? I immediately said, no, I cannot. Why did I say no? Because I am not skilled enough to do it. I am not professional enough, professional enough in my filmmaking abilities to make something that should be at a specific quality level. I am not good, as evidenced by these films that I make. They're not color graded correctly. I don't know anything about Kodak. Half, Kodak, half the time, I don't even know what my settings are. I'm just filming and slapping it together. That is not good enough. If I say yes to that assignment and take that money and turn in a less than subpar, less than, less than stellar, film or motion piece or video or whatever you want to call it, I am doing a disservice to the industry itself until I train myself to a level to accept those jobs. And that's what gets lost in photography is everyone's like, I'll fake it till I make it and then I'll take whatever these jobs are and I'll turn in cinematic whatever and then you look at it and you're like, this is empty calories. This is useless content that is just not doing anything for anyone. So the reason that this film is going to a photographer, and by the way, I get people asking me to give them film all the time, and 99% of the time I say no. You know why? Because they're not people who are willing to go basic levels to educate themselves about what it is they're actually doing. This person is taking a photo 101 class at a community college. This is not expensive. This is not hugely time consuming. She could also do it online if, if, they, if they wanted to do it, they could do it online. There's a ton of ways to educate yourself about photography, and I think a lot of people spend more time and energy weaseling out of doing that than they would the a time and energy required to actually do it. I'll give you one last example, and then I promise I'll kind of shut up until later today when I'll probably release seven more films. Way back in the day, I started blogging, 2002. Blogging to me was a gold mine. I had been writing in a paper journal, physical journal for years, and someone, the guy who invented the blogger platform, I don't remember his name now, I think it's Jeffrey something. Jeffrey said to me, hey dude, the, a blog is the same thing you're doing in paper, it's just online. And I was like, this is perfect for me, I can do whatever I want. So 2002, I really start blogging for real. But I never went full in on blogging. I never like sold my soul. I never put a used car ads on the front page like a lot of other photographers I knew at the time. You'd go to their blogs and there'd be like flashing banners and like buy this thing and buy that thing. And I was like, this is just egregious. I was just like, this is fun. It's an outlet for me. The first piece I ever posted on my blog got syndicated by 300 different newspapers in the country that saw it, picked it up, one picked it up. And then through their syndication process, it went out and was published in 300 different papers around the country. It was a story about Los Angeles. And I was like, okay, so maybe what I'm doing has a little bit of value to someone out there, but it's primarily a selfish thing. I'm just gonna post and do whatever I want. So I'd been blogging for a couple of years and I get a phone call, like literally where you take that device you have in your front pocket that's nuking your nuts all day long and you put it up to your head and you use it like a phone. I got a call from a stranger and I answered the phone. And it was someone I didn't know from calling from a foreign land. And she said, hey, I've been reading your blog and quote, you are on to something, unquote. However, you cannot keep doing what you're doing. Photography is your thing, clearly, but your blog is all over the place. You know, she said, you're doing one post about photography and then you're writing a fake 
television review about why Charlie's Angels is the best television show in history. You can't do that anymore. You have to just do photography. Nothing outside that spectrum. If you do that, you will grow exponentially. And by the way, this person's blog had won best b travel blog in the world for multiple years in a row. She was an expat, diplomat, kid, um, super intelligent, worldly, and so she had seen massive success on a on a blog scale that really changed her life uh, in terms of like what she was what she's doing now and everything else started with the blog. This was back when this kind of thing happened prior to everyone sort of abandoning the blog idea to just sell their soul on social and, and blogs were still like gaining in, in size at the time, even though the mainstream journalism world immediately hated blogs. Immediately, everybody hated blogs. The US military hated blogs. The journalism world hated blogs. Everyone was like, oh, you're just a blogger because they were so afraid of the transition that was about to go down, which was the transfer of power from the traditional models of information to a free form chaos model that we have today. So anyway, this, this person says to me, look, you're onto something, you could be super successful, but you can't do what you're doing, you have to do this. And I said, no. I politely said no. And I think I offended them because they were trying to do me a solid and said, look, you're, again, you're onto something, you could be very successful, you just have to change a couple of things. And I said, no, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna just write about photography, that's boring to me. There's enough being written about photography and I'm just one guy with one opinion, it doesn't matter. I wanna do whatever I wanna do. That's the key to the blog is freedom. I wanna be able to write a political post if I want. And by the way, the first post that got syndicated, it was a story about LA, but it was a, it was a story, a narrative that I wrote in my journal in the middle of the night after hearing a drive-by shooting outside my apartment and me fabricating in my mind who the players were involved. And it was called Half Awake to My LA. And the fact that the, the perpetrators weren't shooting at me meant that I could go immediately back to sleep because that's what living in LA was like. You realize if they're not shooting at you, it's just noise in the night and you get on with your life. And so that's, it had nothing to do with photography. So which in essence, what she was telling me was, yeah, 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 that's all fine, but you can't do that anymore. And I was like, no, because you have to stick to your guns, right? You have to say no when it is strategic to say no. You do not fake it till you make it in photography. It just drives me crazy. You have people who are faking it till they make it. And these same people are complaining about the state of the industry. And I'm like, you can't have it both ways. So if you want film, you gotta put the legwork in. You have, to, you have to get training. You have to ask for help to get better and you have to either take classes online, take classes in person, or do a hell of a lot more research and a lot more practice to get better. Who was that? Okay, that's the lesson for the day. There is gonna be a workout in this film. Oh, what do we got outside? We got outside, by the way, did I mention this? I did, oh, I already mentioned the snowshoe hike. Got some photos I loved yesterday. The 100 to 400, I'm telling you, I've never had this lens before. It's a total blast. Coming from a short lens people person to a wildlife master photographer. Oh yeah.